Uh, given our short period of time, I'm gonna, I hope I can get in this summary up front the main things that I want you uh, to take away. I should say that uh, whereas some people operated at 10,000 feet and some at 30,000 feet, Olivia asked me to operate up at about 60,000 feet and bring in the whole issue of entitlements, which she actually alluded to in, in a, a couple earlier comments. Because at the end of the day, most of the money uh, and most of the issues that we're talking about uh, uh, affecting uh, older workers or older retirees actually come from government. They do not come from, uh, uh, from, uh, from private plans. In fact, a number of years ago, I did a calculation actually tacking on to something Olivia did where she calculated the present value of all the assets of, of, of households. And on average, it was 200, 250, depending on, depends on what year you use, what discount rate you use. I do calculations on Social Security and Medicare. I had Medicare, by the way, which I think is crucial in this question. It comes up to close to a million dollars for a couple retiring today, going up to about a million and a third for those of you in the audience who are about 50 years old. So when you think about that, you quickly realize you've got to solve these issues uh, somewhat at the same time. So my basic, the basic themes of our paper is that basically reform of these entitlements are inevitable. They've got all sorts of problems. And by the way, not just the private pension issues we discussed today, but, but the broader entitlement issues. Uh, on the positive side, we suggest that there are two very positive forces in the economy, one of which we've always had, hopefully we'll sustain it, which is that economic growth gives us substantial opportunities to do, th do th new things if we don't box ourselves in. And also, we'd argue that there's a rise in the supply and demand uh, for older workers. I think a lot of people recognize the rise in the supply of older workers. I think there's been much less attention given to the fact that there is a, an increased demand for older workers, too. And if we play on those positive forces, it, it tells us some of the solutions in these problems. And that leads us to, we think, to constructing reform around three goals. Is we need to better target retirement resources to the needier and the older of uh, population. We need to remove obstacles to employment of older workers because we really need to take advantage of the work they'll provide. And we need to build up this second tier of private uh, retirement support, which, which we've been discussing a lot today. I should mention, by the way, there's a temptation in this particular group to always search for financial solutions. We're trained as economists and as, as actuaries and as accountants. So we, we try to figure out how we can re-manipulate the numbers to get a financial solution to this problem. But I just remind you that the, the basic force that's requiring us to do reform today is a labor force issue. This decline in scheduled workers from three workers per retiree to two workers per retiree in a largely pay-as-you-go system on the government side, but also has impact on the private side, is the pressure that's being forced up on us. And it's been a three-generation drop in the birth rate, but we're forced with the baby boom retirement to basically finally make the adjustment in one generation. And for two generations, we skipped making the changes we wanted to do because basically women entered the white workforce and baby boomers were in the workforce and they sort of hit on a cash flow basis all these things that we, we had to do. So here's just a classic graph on the huge growth in health and retirement spending, which continues to grow uh, uh, inexorably. Uh, most of this, by the way, is, is for, for the elderly. Uh, this is just a little graph. If you look on the far right there, I've done a calculation on the percent a per capita income growth that goes for health care, it's still at about 33%. Even though you've got some notion that the excess cost of health care is going down, uh, the percent of income growth that it's taking is still sitting way up there at about a third. And by the way, that has huge effects on any projection anybody's doing uh, for what we're going to be able to finance in the future because, again, a huge amount of that cost is in old age. Uh, we know Social Security is out of balance. To me, the simple, the simple calculation here, you can look at the top two graphs between cost and income. Driven largely, by the way, those of you who skipped through the numbers, it's largely this drop in workers to retirees from three to one to two to one. And that if you have that type of shift uh, dodging the economic growth question, you basically have to increase tax rates on, on workers by 50% or you have to cut benefits by, on retirees by 33% or you have to do some combination thereof. There's no way of getting around that issue. That's, 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 that's the force, the force on, on the system. And the trust fund balances sort of can confuse that whole debate. Uh, a part of this issue, and I mentioned the labor force side of this, is in the, we talk about aging, there's, there's a particular problem. In the sense that aging is two very distinct problems. Aging is partly the fact that the birth rate fell, and so therefore we are, as a population, getting older. That is, a larger share of us are the last half of our life, or the last 10% of our life. The fact that we're living longer, although it's put under the category of aging, doesn't mean we're necessarily aging at all. It usually means we've got better health care, we've got better capabilities. It's only that aspect of living longer that coincides with retirement systems that keep a fixed retirement age 
that take this good thing happening to us and make it into a bad budgetary problem, whether for the private sector uh, or, the, or, or the government sector. And basically, the current system is just not sustainable at this level. Right now, we're going to a world where about a third of the adult population is scheduled to be on Social Security for a third or more of their adult lives. That is just simply, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna manipulate your DB and your DC plans. You're not even gonna raise tax rates but to solve that problem. It was just retiring that many people for that long uh, is a real problem. And the graph here basically shows that uh, a typical couple can get benefits for about 10 years longer than they could when Social Security was first established. It's partly because they retire earlier, but a lot of it has to do with that they're living longer. So a typical couple today is getting benefits for about 30 years, that is the longer living of the two. One person in a couple could usually expect to make it to about age 90. And that's a huge cost to a system, and it has impacts not just on the numbers we look at, you know, we look at the retirement systems, we look at Social Security. The biggest impact of some of it is on the labor market and on the personal income people earn, because if they're working less, the projected growth rates by all the budget offices are lower in the near future. Uh, basically because we have this declining rate of labor force participation. Uh, so there's impacts. If you do things like increase the early retirement age of Social Security, it has almost no effect on Social Security balances, if that's what you think you're going to focus on. It has a huge impact on income tax revenues because all these people are retiring early. That's, we did a study here at the, at the Urban Institute uh, that basically showed the biggest impact was there. So go on. Uh, uh, in the private system, people have talked about uh, what's going on there. This is just some charts that one of my colleagues did. It shows that there's been no growth even in the last six years in DB assets. The DC assets are growing by 25%. Uh, so that trend is not only continuing, it's continuing at a very fast rate. Uh, we also know, and this hasn't really come up yet, that the distribution of tax benefits is basically horrendous. The, the bottom 60% of the population only gets about 11% of the total tax benefits. So they're not really doing the job we want, either in protecting people in old age or basically uh, getting, getting money to the people who, 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 who need, need it most. So all these systems have these fundamental problems that have to be dealt with. On the positive side, however, uh, there are opportunities at hand. I first mentioned that economic growth provides enormous opportunities to us. If you look at an Obama budget, you even look at a Ryan budget, and you look at what's being projected in the future, you actually see huge increases in income over time, largely from economic growth. And so then the question is, what do we do with that economic growth? And the second issue that's, that's fundamental is I think employment rates are growing fairly rapidly among the elderly. And I think, as I say, I think it's because of supply and demand issues. So to try to prove that point very quickly in, in the three minutes I have left, is this basically asks the question is, do we live in an age of austerity? GDP per household, total GDP divided by number of households, it's about $140,000 per household. 10 years from now, the projections are it'll grow by another $27,000. This is not a poor nation that can't do anything. How about spending of government? It's supposed to grow by $9,000 per household. If you take total spending of federal, state, and local governments, add in tax subsidies, it averages $55,000 per household. It's gonna to grow to 65,000, presumably another 10 years. This is not a poor nation, or there are a government that can't do things. Even the tax subsidies are supposed to grow by another $3,000 per household. So there is money to do things. The trap we're in is we're in a trap where we don't reallocate it very well. On the labor force side, uh, this is a little study that I've done. The, the, the parallel lines, the horizontal lines you see are Social Security projections from 87, 86, 92, 2000 on up on what's gonna happen to the labor force participation of men aged 65 to 69. Basically, they have, over all this period of time, mainly said whatever the current rate is, it's going to about stay there and then sort of flatten out. The line on the left, the black line, is what's actually been happening. A huge increase in the labor force participation of older workers, which many of you know about. And I think the fundamental flaw, by the way, in many models I see in the private sector, not just Social Security, is that they look at this as just a supply-side phenomenon. You know, well, the normal retirement age is going up, or maybe people, oh, the new generations, for some reason, want to work longer because, because jobs are easier. There's a demand side to this, too. If you assume that demand for labor has some elasticity, that is, it's not totally elastic, it's, uh, it has some inelasticity, then as you get fewer young people to work, that demand has to be met by older workers. And so part of what we're seeing is not just an increase in supply, we're seeing an increase in demand, which to me largely explains why many of these projections have been off for so long. So if we take advantage of those two, of those two uh, uh, factors, 
we have the potential, again, from 60,000 feet, dodging what we've got built into the law that constrains us, we have enormous opportunities to deal, to deal with, these, with these fundamental issues. And how might we do it? Well, the first reform we need to do is we need to ensure that Social Security really is oriented more and more toward the poor of the elderly. We can do that at a modest cost, but also the older of the elderly, which means things like increasing not just the normal retirement age, which is a benefit cut, but the early retirement age. And by the way, to orient more to the poorer of the elderly, we then do things like minimum benefits and other things to make sure that type of change is fairly progressive on average. And that's actually fairly, fairly easy, easy, easy to do. I should mention, by the way, that the current trend of older workers working more is more concentrated among higher income than is lower income people. What that's actually doing, if you think about it, it's actually increasing the inequality of income among the elderly because the higher income people who are already better off are the ones that are now getting all the, all the annuity adjustments and other things. The second reform uh, that we suggest is that let's stop discouraging work at older ages. That means let's stop telling people they're old at age 62. Now, I may have a Freudian reason at this point for, for engaging in that, in that type of explanation, but, but when you've got more than one third of your life remaining, that's, that's, that's a crazy definition of, of what it means to be old. We tell people they're old then. We have an earnings test that a great many of the public interpret as a tax, and Social Security benefit uh, people in the offices actually often encourage people to take their money as soon as they can. We have total confusion among the public about the fact that there's this great annuity you can buy in Social Security, but Social Security doesn't offer us partial retirement options, uh, which would allow us to buy a higher annuity. It doesn't allow us to do, do, with, do with some of these things. And as many people have already talked to here, the cash replacement uh, in 60s may not be adequate uh, in your 80s and 90s. None of that has, has to remain that way. And then finally, the final slide is that uh, uh, on the private pension side, we can think about reshuffling these tax subsidies. It's not just their current level, they're growing over time, right? Because they're basically proportional to benefits. We can move beyond an employer-sponsored system to uh, perhaps critically deal with small firms and workers with low wages, scattered work histories. We talk a lot about that. I don't know that we have anything New that people haven't mentioned here, but that's a crucial uh, part of this. But the final notion is, is this has to be integrated. We should be doing all this together. We should be talking about Social Security, Medicare, private pension reform. We should be talking about the bundle because they are all part uh, of, of one and the same issue. Thank you.